So let's uh, let's uh, let's get started. It is a it is a full agenda, and um, and the first thing up is uh, is audit quality. Now, Brian, uh, not long ago you held a very successful uh, symposium uh, that you uh, hosted. There were a number of international guests talking about some of those developments, and uh, a lot of discussion about what's had, happening in the Canadian marketplace. So I'll turn it over to you to talk about uh, some of the implications for, uh, for audit committee members. Well, Don, thanks very much. Um, I appreciate being here this morning and, and the opportunity to speak to um, a thousand plus directors on some of the issues around audit committees and the focus that we have this morning. Um, what I want to do is cover a little bit in terms of the relationship uh, that CPAB has with uh, audit committees, some external auditors, relationship with audit committees, and the management um, uh, as well, management of the organizations and their relationship and, and the chart that you're looking at. Um, one of the things at CPAB we started uh, in this past year in 2014, we'll continue it into 2015, was to outreach to audit committees and uh, really asking the question of how can we enhance or help them enhance audit quality and make them hopefully uh, more effective in what they're doing. And I think we've had a number of initiatives around that. Uh, one of the keys we think to this is, is um, making sure that, uh, and Don mentioned this in our transparency efforts, uh, we've done a public report for a number of years. Uh, this year uh, in 2014, in March, we started uh, sharing with uh, audit committees significant findings uh, that CPAB has. These are findings that, in our view, um, the auditors have not done enough audit work uh, to support the opinion. So they're rather significant. Uh, but we have developed a protocol uh, with the firms where the firms would share this information, and we think that's a huge step forward in the whole area of transparency. But one of the things that we, in talking to audit committees as we've reached out, um, we're encouraging, and one of the things we're trying to do is by greater transparency and hopefully uh, the utilization of our public report, which has typically come out in March. We put uh, the Big Four report out in November, and that was really at the request of some of the audit committees in order to uh, get an early update in terms of some of our significant findings and also assist audit committees as they approach their own year ends. Most of the year ends in Canada are around December 31st. So one of the things that we've been trying to work with audit committees on is to ensure that there's a robust discussion uh, between the external auditors, management, and the audit committee. And we think if there is a robust discussion, we will improve audit quality. And one of the things we've been chatting about is talking to audit committees and getting them to reflect a little bit in terms of in their meetings, are they very much in a compliance mode or are they moving towards governance or in a governance mode? And what I mean by that is a difference in terms of compliance is really going through and saying, yes, the audit's been completed, yes, we got a, a clean opinion, a meeting is concluded, we had a, some discussion but not a lot. When you start to move towards what we would refer to as a governance mode, you're really uh, addressing some of the key audit risks. And we think this is so important. As you plan your audit, you identify key risks. Have those risks been mitigated? Have you discussed with management and the auditors in a robust fashion in terms of how you came at, uh, how estimates were uh, developed, how valuations were developed? Has there been disagreements between management and the auditors in how those, the process of developing uh, those types of things or the tough issues? Even though they may have been resolved before they got to the audit committee, has the audit committee really delved in and had some good discussion around that? So one of our focuses is what can we do at CPAP to encourage a more robust discussion between the auditors, the audit committees, and management? And we think that's key to, in the long term, enhancing audit quality. I also wanted to touch this morning on, and Don has talked about our symposium. We held a symposium last uh, 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 in December last year. A lot of international developments. Canada is not an island, as Don has said. There are a number of developments that are occurring in Europe and in the United States that will impact us. For example, in Europe, mandatory firm rotation has been put in place by the European Union. Um, it's uh, over a 20-year period. Um, and I won't get into all the details around that, but I think that's something that people should be looking at. And I think one of the, the key to that mandatory firm rotation is you need to think about that in terms of where you might, somebody might say, well, it's 20 years, uh, I don't have to worry about it for a while, or I don't really have an operating subsidiary in, the, in, in, in Europe. Well, there's two things I would raise with, with the group. Number one, um, 
If you watch in terms of the 20 years, the Netherlands and the European Union has indicated to the 28 member states that they should feel uh, if free if they wish to raise the standard, uh, and that would mean uh, implementing a different standard than the 20-year mandatory firm rotation. They should feel free to go ahead and do that. And a number have. The Netherlands, for example, moved to an eight-year mandatory firm rotation. I understand they're going to change that to a 10-year mandatory firm rotation. So in Europe, you may have very different uh, requirements uh, in different countries. Uh, so you need to be aware of that. You also need to be aware that there's a term used in Europe about public interest entity. So you don't really need to be raising capital in Europe. You don't need to have a subsidiary there. But if you are, have a significant business operation in those uh, jurisdictions, you may be swept up in some of these rules. So uh, that's something that I would encourage everyone to have a real good look at. We also are aware that there's going to be an expanded audit report. IAASB has approved that, so sometime in 2016, 2017, uh, we will see an expanded audit report, which will include, and I think the key to this is key audit matters. The U.S. is also looking at this, um, and the U.S. tells us that they will have something out uh, on a timely, in a timely fashion in 2015, and they will be right there with the Europeans in terms of implementation. So in those expanded reports, you're going to have a report, a pass-fail, go from one page to probably five, six, seven pages of what is being referred to as key audit matters. These are matters that are key to the audit, what has been important, what are some of the more challenging audit areas. Um, again, uh, does this make this more relevant? I think that's a real challenge, and I think that's where some of this has come from in the European uh, community. One of our concerns in all of this is it's implemented that it does not become boilerplate, and I think that's something that we all need to really focus on, because if it becomes boilerplate, we'll go from a pass-fail uh, one-page report to a pass-fail boilerplate on critical or key audit matters uh, to five or seven uh, pages, and I don't think we'll get what we were looking for. I also want to just touch on one other thing that's coming up, and a number, number of people ask me as we go to audit committees, how do you measure audit quality? And that is a challenge. A number of folks have looked at that. And I, but I think we're developing tools uh, internationally, and I think the U.S. is taking the lead on this, is tools which will help audit committees determine whether they've had a quality audit or not. And one of those areas is uh, key audit, um, or audit quality indicators. And hopefully in the discussion, Don, we'll get into some of this as to what those are. But I think those are areas that, uh, and they're trying to get it down to probably 15 or 20 uh, key audit indicators. So if you can do that and you can put some context around it, I think it'll be a tool for audit committees to really work with their auditors in evalu evaluating audit quality. Let me uh, move maybe to, uh, I'll say, the domestic front in terms of coming back to Canada. And while what I've just spoke about in international will definitely impact Canada, I think there's some things that we've been doing in Canada that I'd like to raise with you um, folks this morning. I have mentioned the protocol. Uh, CPAB it wants to be more transparent. We want to uh, see that our public report is more utilized by audit committees. Uh, but also importantly is that our, our key audit findings, uh, these are significant risks, are shared with audit committees. And again, we're trying to create that robust discussion between management, the auditors, and the committee and give you some additional tools to evaluate uh, audit quality, but also to highlight areas where we would have uh, some concerns. I, I want to touch on two things. Uh, one is we spent a lot of time looking at auditing in foreign jurisdictions. And I think that's one that's a key challenge. If you're doing business in a foreign jurisdiction, I would encourage you, as you've gone into that business, I'm sure you've looked at the different cultures, the different um, uh, business practices, the different legal structures. That is really no different when you're doing an audit. And I would encourage you all to have a real hard look at this in terms of what is the culture in that jurisdiction, what are the business practices in the jurisdiction, and what are the legal structures in particular. And it's not that you can't audit in those jurisdictions, but I think you need to really ask your auditors, how have they adjusted their audit procedures to reflect a different culture or a different business practice? In some jurisdictions, we've learned over the last number of years that you can't rely on bank confirmations that we rely here on in Canada. So you've got to still establish that there's either money in the bank or there isn't. So what procedures do you use to do that? 
So I would encourage you uh, to think uh, through that carefully and, and discuss that with your auditors. I also want to touch on uh, some trends in the audit fees. And that's an area that um, we do have some concerns uh, in relation to. And this isn't, uh, from our perspective, uh, we don't want to interfere in a competitive marketplace. We understand that there is a good uh, back and forth with the audit, the audit committees, the auditors, management, et cetera, on what the fee should be. But we do get very concerned when we hear about fees dropping by 40 or 50 percent. Um, that to us is unrealistic. There are certain uh, efficiencies you can drive, but for a fee to drop by 50 percent, that just doesn't make sense. And what you really not to think about is from an audit committee perspective, is that audit committee, is that audit firm going to put the resources necessary to do an effective audit? And I think those are some of the issues. But I also know it's not just the current audit that's coming up. It's that audit five or six years from now. And one of the things that we're concerned about at CPAB is that we have a viable audit market down the road. And if you see fees continuing to decline or if margins continue to be squeezed, because it's not just the decline, it's where the fees don't rise. So they, the firms all have to pay their salaries in terms of staff more, the cost of office space is increasing. So the margins are being squeezed as well. So when the firms or if the firms stop investing in their people or train in regard to training, in regard to uh, experience globally, internationally, doing excuse me, doing a number of things like that, that's a real challenge. So I would encourage you all to really think about this in terms of uh, where audit fees are headed. Is it a reasonable fee uh, for uh, the services being provided? So those are just some of the things that I wanted to touch on this morning, Don. Um, uh, Brian, uh, thank you. I know a very full agenda that uh, you're working with because I was in attendance at the symposium. Uh, one of the things I, I, I find very interesting is, is this whole issue of you know, understanding what, what do we mean by audit quality. <clears throat> and it's, it's, uh, it's a difficult concept. How do you, how, how do you, how do you explain it? what should audit committees be, uh, be looking for? Uh, obviously, you refer to uh, audit quality indicators, which I think will help uh, um, um, audit committees get a better handle on it. But maybe a bit more about, uh, about that, about what is audit quality and the indicators to help uh, audit committees understand that. Well, uh, well, I think from an audit committee point of view, um, you, you develop an audit plan. You discuss that with audit, the auditors. You discuss that with management. That plan identifies your key audit risks, your key business risks. Um, are they being mitigated um, in terms of that robust discussion that I think needs to take place between the audit committee management and the auditors? Have those key risks been mitigated? And if they have, uh, I would say to you probably 99% of the time you've got a quality audit. But in order to maybe have that discussion in an effective manner, there are certain key um, audit quality indicators that may be of assistance. And, and let me just give you one example. I mean. Uh, one of the ones that they're looking at is the amount of time that the engagement partner or partners uh, spends on a particular engagement. Is that 25% of their time? Is it 30% of their time? Um, that may in itself not be the sole indicator, but it's really trying to put context around that. So when they spent 30% of their uh, time on the particular audit or whatever it happens to be, uh, was that putting out fires? Was that value added? What was actually being con uh, done during that period? Is that the norm? Is that something that if you compare an audit of a similar size and another uh, engagement partner was spending 60% of their time, is that something that the audit committee uh, should be concerned about? But those are all discussions that uh, I think will lead to enhanced audit quality by asking the auditor to explain uh, why maybe 60% of the partner's time was spent on this engagement versus 30% uh, or 25%. But it really is key to put the context around that to make sure that uh, you fully understand as to what was being discussed during that period. Uh, now, Jim and Patricia, you serve on audit committees. Um, your experiences in terms of you know, audit quality, what is, it, what is it you're looking for uh, in your committees and meetings in terms of the, the, the audit quality? And maybe even how do you differentiate, you know, there's audit quality and then audit service. Are those two separate things you look at, uh, different? But um, maybe, Jim, I'll start with you. And Patricia, your thoughts sure. on it, too. Uh, I think it's a big struggle for audit committees. Um, and, uh, and I think that... Uh, the issue of uh, what is, uh, you know, 
what is audit quality is a is a challenge. Um, and as Brian alluded, you know, we can only get at it indirectly uh, because you don't want the audit committee getting audit files and plowing into the, into that level. That's what CPAB's all it for. <laughs> That's what they're supposed to do, uh, kind of thing. Um, but I think the audit committee can handle get a good reading on several things. One is what's the quality of the audit plan. And uh, what uh, does the audit plan really address and line up their risks uh, identified in the audit plan? Does that line up with the audit committee's assessment of risk? And is there a connection there uh, kind of thing? Um, um, is, uh, what's, the, what's the quality of the reporting? What are the findings? Um, what's the information that's coming back? What's the level of communication between the auditor and the audit committee? Um, and uh, and uh, are, are we dealing with uh, minutia or, or are the auditors surfacing you know, substantive issues uh, and reports in their, in their interaction with the audit committee? Uh, so, uh, Don, I think that the audit committee has to look at those levels of things because you don't want the audit committee trying to dive down. And that's not their job and that would be a waste of time. That's Brian's role is to deal with that. But, uh, but that would be my quick assessment. Uh, uh, Patricia, what's Patricia, your, you're uh, I, I would say, you know, I would tend to agree with what Jim just said. Uh, I guess the other thing is from, a, from one year to the other, are we touching base on the same issues? Are we taking a notice of what's happening in the outside world, bringing this back to in context with what's touching the company? And are the uh, auditors really in tune with that, or they just have a cookie cutter program touching again on the same aspect? You know, they're, they're comfortable with that. Management is comfortable with that. But then you have an issue of trying to break out of that mold and trying to push them to ask themselves, you know, other types of questions that could impact the company. Yeah, I think that's a critical part is, is understanding, you know, do they really understand the industry, the outside world, bringing that perspective? You know, do they understand the commercial challenges, the incentives, those sort of things? And that would come out through discussion at, uh, at uh, audit committees. 